Collaboration is fantastic. It's one of the things that we're building this system on. But if it's just simply about best practice, by which I mean, I've got some good stuff going on in my classroom, come and have a look at it, but you can decide what you do with it. To actually saying, how do we build a 10-year career pathway for the people that we work with? That's the challenge that I want us to try to meet in the next five years. One of the ways I approached the underpinning of, of this uh, when I was a CEO was to talk about the progression points in a child's education. Now, as a secondary specialist, and for many of you, progression point four will be the one that you'll, uh, your eye will be drawn to because it's the change in 11, uh, you know, the age transfer at 11 from primary to secondary. And of course, that's really important. And of course, it's challenging. And I think there are more children find it difficult than we know. I think it's a really difficult part of their, of, of their development. But it's not the only one. And I suppose what I'm trying to build a thesis around is that the journey from the, for the three or the four-year-old from home to nursery reception, is that any more challenging than going to secondary or any more challenging than the 18-year-old who leaves home to go to university? They're just different. And if you think about my learning triangle and how we build that community confidence in leadership and we underpin an education system by a better understanding of these progression points, then I think you begin to see why I'm so passionate to use the metrics as an indicator, not the policy. Let me talk a bit about the performance challenge for a second, sorry, which is causing me some fun this morning. One of the performance challenge issues for me is what I said a moment ago about school improvement not being linear. Um, and it's one of the issues, I think, that we face when we describe whole schools uh, by one word, outstanding good, requiring, or two, that's two as a hyphen, requiring improvement or special measures. Because what it doesn't tell you is that that judgment's often the best fit. So the good school will have some outstanding practice and it will have some requiring improvement practice, but it settles at good. The requiring improvement school will have some good practice, but not enough, and some weak practice, and it settles at requiring improvement. And if we're going to improve the system quickly, I think we have to have a much more granular approach to that. So what I've been trying to do is to build um, a school improvement picture that recognizes that there are four stages of the journey. I call the first one the stabilize phase. And if you've ever worked in this school, stabilize is quite a modest word for that school because pretty much most of the things you encounter are broken. Uh, behavior, attendance, staff well-being, morale, results, and probably the budget. Um, and the only promise that uh, I can make you if you ever take on a school like that is it will be worse on day one than anybody told you. <laughs> but you have to recognize that that's a part of the process of improvement in the system. The second phase I'm gonna call the repair phase. And I think this comes in around about 12 months after that first phase has done its work. Because some of the things that you started to do first, some of those early priorities are beginning to bed down. It's still a bit chaotic. On a wet Wednesday afternoon in January when the wind is blowing, it still feels a little bit like we're instabilized. But actually, it's getting better. And you're beginning to feel like the school is starting to become under more control and the things that you want to see happening are starting to happen. <coughs> I want to call the third phase the improve phase because here there's a switch from being reactive to being proactive because now you're talking about six, 12, 18 months ahead. But I think you're two years at least into the journey. My comments before about the time it takes to turn schools around. And the fourth phase, uh, I'm gonna borrow unashamedly from Maslow's hierarchy of need. He calls it in the top part of his pyramid, the self-actualization uh, phase. I think this is the sustained phase where you see schools becoming confident, innovative, and more risk-taking. And I think we have to recognize that schools go through this process. But if you take an entire school what I've started to do with some of the multi-academy trusts that I'm working with is to say, you actually need to apply that logic to your teams, your subjects, your year groups, your own leadership team. Because if in a secondary context, I've got a school that's called good, but my science faculty is in repair, or I've got a primary school which has got a good judgment, but my early years is in repair, I'm gonna have a real struggle to get to outstanding. And that's the kind of depth of language and understanding school improvement has to start to think about. I think there are two intelligences that underpin that. So just hold these things together if you can. One is that learning triangle I mentioned. Then I talked about the progression points. Then there's the phases of school improvement. And now I think there are these two intelligences. On the left, I talk about impact intelligence. What I mean by that is, in impact intelligence, there's enough experience people are receptive for their previous jobs to understand how to improve behavior, how to improve phonics, 
how to improve community engagement. All of those bits of the, tr of the, of the, of the, of the matrix, the, the jigsaw puzzle that make our school of improvement are there and intact. And if your leadership team is really good at emotional intelligence, which you absolutely need, they know how to take people with them. They know how to explain that vision. They know how to make clear to people what their role in that journey is. But here's the challenge, and some of you will recognize this. If your leadership team is all about impact intelligence, but not so good on the emotional intelligence, boy, have you got some great plans. But they're not getting past classroom doors because people don't understand their role. And actually, you're so good at planning, why do I need to do it? But if your team is really, really high on emotional intelligence, but not so much on impact, morale will be good for a while. Because what I see in those leadership teams and those schools is people start to get frustrated because they can see what needs to be done and it isn't happening. So the best leaders that I've worked with and the leaders that have worked with me understand that your leadership teams need to be made up of both of those intelligences. And our leadership training has to be about that. So of course it has to be about the obvious things that we talked about for the last 20 years about leadership. But sometimes they've leaned too heavily to the managing people side of it and not the technical bit of how on earth are we going to improve this school? Because this school is in the stabilized phase and we've got to get it to repair rather quickly. So I want to summarize uh, and hopefully pull together some of those themes, uh, if I can, with two slides which I used um, at an inside government presentation last week, which was for governors and chairs of governors. And I said I thought there were eight questions that as, uh, as governors they need to be asking themselves and their colleagues and their schools in the next six months. Uh, and hopefully you'll see the synergy between this and some of the things I've said already this morning. Number one, the first question I think is, uh, I, I'll read it to you. It says, are we delivering on the promise we made to raise standards in our schools? Because every one of us at some point will have made a promise about what we thought we would do. I read them in funding agreements and the conversion documents and multi-academy trust applications. Nobody ever says we're going to set up this multi-academy trust to make it worse. They all say it's going to make it better. That's, that's quite helpful. But there's a promise there, which I think it's really important that we check. And, and I, the questions that came from the floor in the, at the end of the previous se session were questions about this particular issue. Because you will know in your schools, you are delivering on your promise. But the data says, <laughs> but promise is about engagement, keeping children safe, ensuring children are well taught, and making sure that they can progress to the next level. That's a very good opening question, I think, for governors and leadership teams to look at. The second one is, do parents know and understand what governors do and how they can communicate with them? It's not true to say that every parent is a frustrated parent governor. Some of them have no interest in doing that at all, but they have massive interest in their kids' education. And how do governors make sure there is a communication loop back to parents to hear their voice? The third one is about collaboration uh, and what's, what works at the board level that could be shared with other governors and the credibility, but just substitute the word governors with leaders. And I think that's, a, that, that's an entirely valid uh, question to ask. Question number four cuts to the heart of the moral purpose debate. Do we care enough that a school in our neighborhood is in difficulty? When I started being ahead in 1997 in Gloucestershire, there were 43 secondary schools. We didn't meet that often, but when we did, the conversation over coffee was which school had just got into difficulties. And there was a kind of almost tacit approval that they'd done that because it meant two things. We might get some of their kids, and secondly, we might get some of their staff. And thankfully, I think we've moved beyond that. But that moral obligation, that duty that we have to help another school, I don't mean take it over necessarily, I don't necessarily mean sponsor it, but actually help and empathize that the journey they're about to go on is difficult, and that you're there at the end of a phone if, uh, if they need you. So that last slide was really useful, actually, if I could get to it. This has to be the worst remote controller in the world. Oh, back to the beginning, brilliant. You do it, yeah, that would be really helpful. Oh, great, question five. So the question five is that it goes back to that outstanding point I made earlier on about uh, the current performance of the school in terms of the areas of revision that needs to be better. Um, and, and I think that's a really valid question for governors particularly to be asking because it's, it, it's right in that accountability space. Question number six is how do we know that our educational leaders are working on the right things? Question seven is about the future. What challenges can we anticipate? How can we begin to plan for those? And number eight is about holding the mirror up. 
is our governance model around strategy and vision and accountability as good as we think it is? Now, okay, those questions are framed around governance, and there'll be governors in the audience this morning for whom that's perfectly appropriate. But I still think the questions around uh, that review and that self-evaluation are an important part of it. So I'd just like to say three things uh, to sum up, if I may. Um, number one, your challenge about how you lead and improve your schools and your communities is no different to the one that I, that I face as National Schools Commissioner. And what I've tried to do, I think, this morning is to indicate what I think the, uh, the, the, the cornerstone of that plan for how we improve our system together might be. The second um, part of it, I think, is around the three things that I, I hope I've conveyed to you this morning, but they're the three things that I think I've learned about schools in the last 30 years. Number one, the only really strong, sustainable, and lasting intervention that works is to improve the quality of teaching day in, day out. Everything else is kind of a bit of work around that to bolster it. But if we get teaching right and we support and develop our teachers, that works. The second one around those three things is the role of leadership. Uh, and I think I've made my points around that this morning. And the third one is about collaboration. We can't have 21,000 schools as individual islands anymore. We have to be thinking about how we join the system up and use that best practice to inform the best. And my final point, uh, which I'll pull this together with, is we are in changing times. Education policy, as long as I can remember, certainly since I've been ahead, has always been in the vanguard of change, both political and systemic change. But I genuinely meant it when I said that I think we've got the strongest cadre of leaders in the country at the moment. And we are going to need to step up and do that job better than we've ever done it before, because our communities need it, our children need it. Um, and I've never felt more confident, in spite of the challenges that we face, that we're going to be able to do that. So with apologies for the slightly uh, robotic clicking this morning, thanks for listening.